To balance that, I want to say when you lived and worked in England, you told me once that um, you you told me you were a member of a paranormal research club for psychiatrists or something like that. Yeah. And I was amazed that that even existed because most uh, psychiatrists I know are is completely atheist. Well, within the Royal College of Psychiatrists, there's a group on spirituality and psychiatry, uh, a very active group and really one of the biggest in, in England. Within the within the college, wow. uh, and it's been very active, writing books uh, and uh, getting involved in training young psychiatrists and teaching people to take uh, what we call a, a spiritual history. So when you're seeing a, a new client, you should always explore what his worldview is, his his spiritual experience. What really matters, whether it's in kind of um, traditional religious terms or, or more of a spirituality and personal journey terms mm. and um, so it is really a fascinating group and has opened a lot of this world it's also a very good sign if the royal college of psychiatrists are open to such things as i know you among else you explored uh, you told me about this exorcism uh, de possession stuff like that yes just being interested and open for that uh, phenomenon means that those psychiatrists at least takes their work seriously because their work are, after all, your work is exploring the field of the mind, yeah. also based on medicine, but not just reducing everything to chemicals and uh, pharmacy, right? So, so that is a good sign. Yeah, the concept of uh, exorcism is very very interesting and of the spirituality interest groups we we had a conference on uh, exorcism even more than one and it's been the, mo the most attended i think of all conferences wow. at the college so there was really a lot of interest um, and i was actually one of the speakers there looking at the, the kind of um, appearance of spirits or demons or angels in interviews with people with multiple personality and and to what degree they are demons and angels, or to what degree they are more archetypal aspects of self uh, merging in consciousness and you can kind of have dialogue with them, but they are really parts mm. of yourself. So it's a, it's a fascinating topic. It is. So I did mention this possession exorcism phenomenon earlier, and uh, even though you're not given that phenomenon big space in the book, but I, I will still want to discuss it with you. Okay. Because it, it kind of uh, borders on, on the subject, at least as far as spirituality and insanity goes. And it's tremendously fascinating. And you yes. have deep experience with this. Because you could say it's typical today that we see that in psychiatry, they think all these phenomenons are just illnesses of the mind. Whereas in the more, in the more, mythical realities magical realities they are regarded as you know as entities as something that happens with your mind i i don't know if it's an either or anyway but yeah yeah you want to you want to share some observations around this phenomenon yes i think it's a fascinating area and my view is don't have a view go with the flow <laughs> um i think if you think you know what's happening then you're probably not seeing what's happening. So I always keep an open mind. Sometimes it's more psychological. Sometimes it feels more literal. I can tell you an example. I, I, just a, mm -hmm. a lady that I work with, she was uh, probably in her early 30s. Um, she wanted to have a second child. Now, she was worried because when she had her first child, she got very depressed and was very unwell for for over a year so she wanted to prepare herself for a second pregnancy so she came to psychotherapy for me with me and there were along with it came an interesting observation that she sometimes woke up in the middle of the night very angry and start hitting and screaming at her lovely husband <laughs> poor guy yes and she said seemed to have this oscillation of mood so I saw her for a number of sessions, and we started working on childhood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it didn't seem to make much of a difference. Um, now, usually I'm very cautious, especially in England, you know, where 
kind of exorcism is not really seen as an appropriate <laughs> treatment. No, but I, I do know that uh, Catholic psychiatrists can apply it. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah but anyway, uh, on one occasion, her husband came with her, and I felt, well, that feels a much safer kind of way of exploring things that's slightly different. Now, mm. uh, because I'm also an acupuncturist and learned in, in, uh, in uh, Chinese medicine, um, uh, two o'clock in the morning is liver. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, why don't we just play with this idea? And I, I said, uh, do you mind if you have a look at your liver? And she said, what do you mean, my liver? I can't see my liver. Mm -hmm. Well, just imagination. Uh, play with it with me. What do you see? And she said, well, there's some dark edges. It's purple. And I said, well, let's focus on the dark edges. And after a little while, she suddenly told me that she was in a closed room and there was a young boy in the room. And who was this boy in the room? Oops. She had never told her husband. She had become pregnant when she was 18 and she had an abortion. Wow. And uh, so she had been keeping a big secret of her life. Right. And her husband was there. And I, I said, do you mind if I speak with the boy? And the boy spoke with me and I said, well, what's wrong? And he clearly was in a state of great anger. And I said, well, is it not time to move on? I said, he's not moving on. And we spoke about a possible new child. And he said, no, I'm not happy with that. I wasn't allowed to have any life and all that. And so he was quite stuck with his anger. So I said to the boy, let's look a bit deeper. What's holding you back? Hang on. Did you communicate with the boy through her? Yes, through her. But she, was she in a meditative state? Yes, exactly. Or in a hypnotic state? Well, just in a, I just asked her to go internally and share with what came up in her mind. Okay. And uh, so I sp so the, when the, then we had the third speaker, who was a demon, who said he was there to hold the anger of the boy. And I said, well, he's done an excellent job. <laughs> Even the demons you uh, respect and meet on their own premises. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I thank him greatly for his great labors. He said, well, it's my time to take over, and he's allowed to go, and he did. Wow. So, and then suddenly the, the boy um, was more kind of amenable to discussion, and we agreed that uh, he could go, but he was allowed to come and play with the children from time to time. What children? Well, the born son that was, and the oh my God. child that was going to be, you know. Uh, <laughs> he, became, he, he became an invisible friend? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Now, after the single sessions, all the problems dis disappeared in this lady. Wow. Uh, she start, stopped waking up at, at 2 o'clock in the morning. She became pregnant. She had a child, didn't get depressed. Now, you can look at this in many ways. You can look at this. Yeah. This is trauma and secret during the pregnancy. Memories in the body suppressed. Yeah. Or you can say, well, maybe there is a soul that stuck around, wasn't acknowledged, was unhappy, and he was stuck in negative emotions, and, and the kind of containing field of these emotions was perceived as a demon, or you can take it literally. But anyway, the approach of honoring whatever comes up. I was not making up these images. They came spontaneously. You mm. don't have to really know what they mean. You just go with the flow. You openly engage with them. And what transformation happens? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the important thing. Uh, if you are going to be pragmatic about it, yes. it doesn't matter how we explain it as long as we get to the solutions. Exactly. But not to frighten people here, but the concept of a disconnect soul isn't that far-fetched in science either because as i said in the beginning your father has to a far extent proven as far as you can prove these things yeah, yeah. that reincarnation is an actual phenomenon now of course we don't know all the details around it and how it works blah 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 but it is interesting that it seems to be more because uh, the most people with a modern mind, at least, will immediately go to the psychologization of this, right? Yeah, they will say, "Well, it was in our subconscious; it came through through symbol, yeah. externalized through symbol, all that stuff, right?" Yeah, he really? and obviously his teacher uh, have have um, shown, and he he's got uh, a lot of fascinating cases where. People have memories of past traumas and even can point to their killers yeah. 
what they can bring. And my favorite st of his story was a Sri Lankan young boy who, who claimed to have been a monk in previous lives and got his family to have worship every day. And, and uh, then my father got involved and he found the monastery where he claimed to have been. But what was most interesting was one of the invocation he had taught his family was the secret mantra that was only handed from abbot to abbot in the monastery. Wow. <laughs> and there's many examples of this that you can actually yes. find corroboration. Yes. The other alternative explanation to reincarnation would be precognition, not even that, a form of clairvoyance or telepathy where you can tap into the yes. collective. Exactly. That can be, of course... We'll not even start discussing reincarnation because it's such a huge, it, it, there's so many approaches to it that yeah. we, we'll never get off here. But it is interesting. But, you know, what, like you said in, in your book, fools seldom differ. <laughs> 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 so I think, I think it's better that we use the fools approach here. We just accept these things and we approach it uh, phenomenologically, you know. Yeah. And you can reflect on it afterwards. But while you're in the yeah. process, you just go with the flow. Mm. You honor whatever comes up. Wouldn't some colleagues of you be inclined to disregard that because the born against that say that has dangers or whatever? They, they are afraid. They are afraid the psychosis will be enforced by that. Yeah, you can. You have to show some courage. <laughs> And there's all, it's all about trust. Once you are in a, in a state of trust working with someone, then you can't really go wrong. When there's suspicion and fear, it's certainly going to go wrong. Indeed. The best intentions will crash. I have experienced that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it, to a far extent, you could say that, uh, you know, this notion that you create... You manifest what you expect. I mean, the whole basic of the secret hype, right? Yeah. And that is true in many ways that if you do meet it with... I mean, one of the secrets, let's just disclose that, one big secret in esoterica is the more you trust something, the more it will manifest, you know, in magic. Yeah. If you don't believe... And that's the problem with doubters, with agnosticism, with critical thinkers. They are actually honest in that they examine stuff and they examine their own, which is a healthy principle, you know, to evaluate and, and be critical. But the problem with that is that stupid people, basically, people who have blind faith in their own notions, no matter how crazy and, and wrong the notions are, will manifest that they have the power and people will follow them. They yeah. <laughs> look at the presidential <laughs> election. But if you take it to a kind of a practical level, like um, with in relationship, you know, people fall in love, they see they're fascinating by someone, uh, that uh, someone really inspires them, they get in touch with something wonderful within themselves. But as the relationships start to deepen, we realize that it isn't only the fascination that draws people together, but also the nightmare. Not only the dream and the intention of where they want to go, but their unfinished business draws people probably more. The shadow aspect, the nightmare, right. The, right. the disaster is actually more powerful in drawing people together. And as the relationship uh, deepens, then they start to see their darkness in the opposing partner. And then they project those bad qualities to the partner? Yeah, and if there is enough love, then that that darkness will be healed. Right. But if there isn't enough reflection and love, uh, the darkness will destroy the relationship. Being the done that. So, so it's all. So the darkness, our unfinished business, because we don't know it well enough, it will impact on whatever we do. Mm. And if we get a strong reaction, we better know that it's certainly got a shadow aspect to it. 